Park Ranger Scott Irvine introduces the park after dark video series. He is shown from the waist up, standing in front of a white hearth. The hearth serves as a backdrop but also as a bookshelf for a couple of dozen old, leather bound volumes and an antique clock. There is a framed print above the hearth, too, that is indistinguishable, except that it clearly is a blacked and allied image. Irvine does not distinguish this setting in his talk, but it appears to be in a historic structure, from the type of creme to colored wood paneling on the walls. Irvine is wearing a traditional ranger uniform, with a cocky shirt that is colored. The shirt is short as leafed and buttoned in the front, except for the top button, keeping the collar loose at his neck. The shirt has a small, rectangular, and golden name badge on the right side of it, just above one buttoned pocket, and a National Park Service badge on the left side of it, just above another matching buttoned pocket. A slight hint of the NPS Arrowhead logo is visible on his left sleeve, near his shoulder. Irvine's hair is peppered brown, white, and gray. He shaves the sides, even shorter than his beard, but on top, he lets it grow a bit longer, about the length of his full but trimmed beard. During his introduction, a dozen different images are shown intermittently on the screen while he talks. Each of these will be described briefly as they are shown on the screen. Welcome to Fort Vancouver National Historical Site. Fort Vancouver's wooden post palisade is shown from outside the gates, with a focus on the landmark bastion. The bastion is a roughly two-story tall wooden tower. The first story walls align with the wooden posts that surround the fort as its stockade. The second floor is a distinctive octagon shape, with small windows on each panel that face outward, serving as a watchtower of sorts for keeping track of the nearby Americans and their movements. Outside the stockade is a field of green, with a couple of stretches of fence posts. The sky is clear, ranging from white to light blue, and there is a flock of bees flying over the stockade. Behind the stockade, the tops of medium-sized trees can be spotted. The sun is starting to set, casting a warm light on one side of the bastion and dark shadows on the other. This fall, we are unable to hold this event safely, so we've put a group of our volunteers together to film a series of Park After Dark videos. In this black and white image, four costumed Fort Vancouver interpreters are shown posing in front of a historic building. They are standing in a row and looking into the camera. From left to right, the first interpreter is dressed as a military captain in a formal British uniform. His shirt and hat are dark colored, with light trimmings such as epaulets and buttons. The second character, a woman holding an 1845 sign, has a less formal appearance, wearing an oversized dress. The third character is a woman in a dress as well, but she wears a top hat, like the fourth character, next to her. He has the look of a formal British gentleman. He wears a high collar and a silk cravat. He also is holding a decorative cane. So you can learn more about people and places at Fort Vancouver. As we move into autumn, we hope you join us for this cozy evening. Fort Vancouver is a diverse community that includes Hudson's Bay Company officers, company employees, and their families. A rectangular painting of Fort Vancouver from the mid-19th century illustrates a panoramic of what the fort looked like at its peak, around when it was called the New York of the Pacific. The perspective is from a distance as if the viewer was looking at the scene from a hill a few miles away but with an unobstructed view. The bustling fort area has dozens of buildings inside the stockade and outside in the close vicinity, some of different heights and rectangular shapes but mostly made of unfinished wood. There are a couple of exceptions, such as the counting house, near the fort's gate, which is painted white. On the nearby Columbia River, in the background, a three-masted ship sails by. In the foreground of the fort, there is a garden being tilled by a horse-drawn plow. A few people also are shown gathered near the gate, about to enter the fort, but they are too small in the image to distinguish any details about them. The south side of the Columbia River appears to be heavily forested. The north bank, where the fort sits, is mostly cleared but also still retains trees of different varieties, including an orderly orchard near the palisade. From 1825 to the mid-19th century, Fort Vancouver was regional headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company's Columbia Department. In the 1840s, this became an important stop on the Oregon Trail. 
1845 was an important year for Fort Vancouver, and it was an important year for the National Park Service. A series of six images are shown in rapid succession. The first is a photograph of a young man walking inside the fort's palisade in period dress. He is in the foreground and the focus of the image. He has on a red checkered hat, a long brown coat, a silk cravat, tan pants and high brown boots. The fort's field in this scene is yellow, like in fall, and there are a few indistinguishable people, including fort visitors, in the distance but still within the palisade walls. Part of one of the first door buildings also can be seen. It is a roughly two-story tall wooden building without windows. The second image also shows people in period dress inside the stockade. This time, they are seven young girls, in long dresses, playing a game in the grassy field inside the stockade with sticks and wooden hoops. The third image is a black and white archaeological map of the buildings inside the stockade, showing rectangles to represent the structures, with some minor topographical lines as well. The fourth image is a photograph of Fort Vancouver's kitchen, which is in the back of the chief factor's house. The kitchen has a rough hoon and humble look, especially in contrast to the majestic and white painted walls of the chief factor's house. The kitchen has a covered entryway, where wheelbarrows and stacks of wood for the fireplaces are kept. It has a single window, near the door, on the first floor, but two additional windows, roughly above the door, on the second floor. The final two images show two different perspectives of the fort's bastion and stockade. One shows the same image from earlier in the video, of the bastion and the two fence segments. The second one is a dramatic silhouette of the bastion, at sunset, which highlights the pointedness of the roof and the tree line in the background, with a flock of birds flying over the scene. The fort you see today is a reconstruction built on the archaeological footprint of the original, which stood here until it burnt down in the 1860s. When the National Park Service began the reconstruction in the late 1960s, they decided to recreate the fort as it appeared in 1845. But why 1845? 1845 was a year of great change for this community. When Fort Vancouver was built 20 years earlier, this territory was home to indigenous people, tribes, and nations. A map is briefly shown that illustrates the area of the Pacific Northwest under dispute between British and American forces. This map spans from the 54th parallel to the 42nd parallel, staking out the extreme positions of either side. The countries eventually settled on the 49th parallel, where the current U.S. and Canadian border is today, which meant that Fort Vancouver would have to be abandoned and the Hudson's Bay Company would move its operations several hundreds of miles to the north. British trading posts like Fort Vancouver dotted the landscape. The 1830s had waves of disease due to the increasing presence of trappers and settlers. By the 1840s, missionaries and American immigrants were crossing the Oregon Trail. In the first photo, a band of four pioneers on horses are shown traveling through a dry and grassy field. Each are equipped with a light-colored button-up, a cowboy hat, and a saddle. Three of the four are gazing away from the camera, into the horizon, a pale blue sky divided by a dull green strip of flat farmland. The fourth's face, though turned toward the camera, is indistinguishably shaded by his hat. Behind the men on horses, travels a horse-pulled covered wagon. In the wagon, there are two shadowy figures who look to be a man and a woman. The woman, though her facial features cannot be seen, looks to the camera from the back of the wagon. The man, who sits in the front, is holding the reins of the horses. The second photo is a historic, black and white illustration of Oregon City in 1845. The drawing focuses on the multitude of rectangular shaped houses and establishments that line the Willamette River in Oregon, in the town where Mblalin moved after Fort Vancouver. Though hard to see, each building is decorated with small, arched windows, and the roofs are shaded both dark and light gray. Just outside the city, in the background, lies a church with a pointed steeple. Behind the city lies three distinct, thick layers of shrubbery and forest. Further in the background is the faint outline of Mount Hood. The foreground of the drawing shows the banks of the Willamette River, Across from Oregon City, four people are standing near the water, amid a few trees and bushes. These American immigrants, 
formed a new government south of the Columbia River and challenged the Hudson's Bay Company's influence in the Northwest. At the same time, fur demand in Europe was on a decline and the Hudson's Bay Company focused its attention to agricultural production. This photograph shows a man in period dress holding a plow while it is pulled through a field by two brown horses. The man wears a straw hat, a long-sleeved blue shirt, long gray pants and boots. In the background is the fort's palisade, with a few rooftops and buildings visible over the top of the stockade wall. 1845 was an exciting time to be an American in the Pacific Northwest. Also a challenging time to be a Hudson's Bay Company employee. It was also a time of threat for Native American people as their lives would change forever. This image of an encampment shows a couple of tents set up with long sticks as support poles. The rest of the activity on this sunny day is obscured in the background under the shadows of the trees. It also shows a young girl in a 19th century blue checkered dress, ankle length and long sleeved, walking away from the camera. In this episode, you'll learn about the Chief Factor's house, the operations, and the people who lived here. In this next part of the video, volunteers describe the Chief Factor's house from various rooms within it. The first volunteer is Reggie Coates, dressed as a gentleman clerk, who starts the tour inside the house's large dining room. Coates is dressed in a top hat, with a dark suit, and crimson cravat. The room is painted a striking and vibrant green, with white trim. Coates is speaking next to the dining room's long table, which can seat dozens. The table is covered with a white tablecloth, and is set with spoke dishes, a couple of candle obras, and crystal pitchers. A door open in the background shows access to a red wall parlor. Hello, my name is Reggie Coates and I represent a 19th century clerk here at Fort Vancouver. Welcome to the Chief Factor's house. This grand building with its imposing but purely decorative cannons, two curving staircases, and sweeping 70-foot long veranda was also known as the Big House, and rightly so. Featuring 10 rooms and 2,800 square feet, this is a big house even by today's standards until you realize that not one, but two families lived here. Essentially, this was a 19th century duplex. The exterior of the Chief Factor's house is shown in two successive images, once in daylight and once at night. Coates describes its primary features, and close-up images of the cannons and a staircase provide different angles on some of those, but in these images, the house also can be put into place with the fort's front gate, right next to this house. At a glance, the house is large, white, and with a massive front porch. It has two cannons placed in front of it. Coates also introduces the Mblalins and the Douglases through imagery, with portraits of each showing in the background while he is talking. The first portrait shows James Douglas, later in life, with a medal around his neck and a medallion pinned to this coat. He is formally dressed, in a suit, but he is not wearing a hat, which shows how his peppered gray hair is combed over to one side. He has bushy eyebrows and mutton chops. The second portrait is Amelia Douglas, shown from a distance so her floor-length dress can be seen in full. She has a white hat and headscarf on, with the two flaps of the scarf hanging down her chest. John Mblalin is the third portrait. He wears a dark suit and dark cravat in this black and white image, which contrasts sharply with his light-colored eyes and white mutton chops and hair. The fourth, and final portrait in this series, shows Marguerite Mblalin, with a white black gown, complemented by a white fringe collar. Her hair is parted in the middle and drawn back to each side, so it's unclear how long her hair is but that it is longer than seen. Two interior photographs of the house also are shown. The first is another view of the large dining room, described earlier, with its distinctive green walls. In that image, a servant is setting the table. The next set of images shows the red parlor, mentioned earlier as adjacent to the dining room. In one of these photos, three women dressed in 19th century costumes are seated at a table, working on needlecraft and chatting. Their outfits are long dresses, with long sleeves. 
They have a lantern in the middle of the table, with a lit candle inside of it. In the background, glimpses of parts of furniture give the impressions of a couch, chair, and a couple of chests of drawers, including a large stand, topped by a silver tray and tea set. The other photos show slightly different uses of the same room, with one photo showing basically the same scene, only with two of the women. In the third image, a table has been set for dining, and six young women in period costumes sit around it and wait for their meals, with a male servant in the background. Also interjected into this series of photos is an image of the Hudson's Bay Company's coat of arms, which is distinguished by its white shield, red cross, and wildlife, including beavers, deer, and a fox. In 1845, the east side of the house was home to Fort Vancouver's second in charge, Chief Factor James Douglas, plus his wife Amelia and their four young daughters. Dr. John McLaughlin, Fort Vancouver's first and longest serving Chief Factor, and his wife Marguerite occupied the west side. In addition to serving as a private residence for these two Chief Factors, the building was also home to one particular room that functioned as a hub for business discussions, religious services, and social activities. This remarkable, vibrantly colored 600 square foot dining room is the largest room in the Chief Factor's house and was in some ways the nerve center for Fort Vancouver. As you know, two families lived in the Chief Factor's house, but this was not a family dining room. Officially referred to as the Gentleman's Mess, it was here that the two chief factors presided over the gentlemen of the Hudson's Bay Company as they dined three times a day, always, always, always discussing company business. So consider this to be like a corporate boardroom with meals. The women and children who lived inside of the house were not company employees and thus could not contribute to business discussions. So they dined separately in the women's mess a small dining room connected to the east parlor on the Douglas side of the house. They received the same food as the men. It was served to them just in a separate location. Here at this elegantly appointed table, set with beautiful blue and white spode dinnerware, the men followed a distinct protocol. Dr. McLaughlin sat at the head of the table, Mr. Douglas to his right. Then the gentlemen of the company, primarily clerks like myself, sat in descending order based upon rank and experience. At the foot of the table sat the newest and youngest clerks who did not speak unless spoken to. They were expected to listen and learn. Then if they worked diligently and proved themselves capable, perhaps in 20 or 25 years, they might find themselves at the head of the table. After all, that's precisely what Dr. McLaughlin and Mr. Douglas did upon entering the fur business when they were teenagers. Almost since the day of its christening, on March 19, 1825, Fort Vancouver welcomed people from everywhere, and the always hospitable Dr. McLaughlin generously made space for them at the table. Several images are shown in succession, while Coates talks. The first is a painting of the HMS Modest on rough waters. Its primary mast stands tall among two smaller sets of sails with all of them puffed up with wind. A smaller single mast ship is in the background. David Douglas is shown next, in a hand-drawn portrait, dressed as a British gentleman, in suit and silk cravat, facing to his right. His hair is thinning, at this point in his life, with a high part. A couple of different images of Douglas fir trees are shown to illustrate his legacy. They are tall and thick pine trees. The next portrait is of John Ball, the fort's first school teacher. He is dressed in a suit with a white fur collar. He has a long white beard and white hair that is short on the top but long in the back. Rapidly, portraits of Nathaniel Wyeth, Jedediah Smith, and Peter Steen Ogden are show. All are dressed as formal British gentlemen of the time period. Wyeth has a high hairline, pushed back to roughly the middle of the top of his head. The drawing of Smith is almost cartoonish in its level of detail, making it more like an impression than a representation of him. Ogden appears to have a shaven chin and upper lip but with a white neck beard, long white hair on the sides, and short hair on top. Another rapid series of portraits features Jason Lee, Marcus Whitman,
Henry Spaulding, and Father Blanchett. Again, because of the speed of the portraits passing by, and the similarity of the dress and images, they are difficult to meaningfully distinguish. Lee and Whitman, though, look to be middle-aged, at most, with Lee having a long dark beard and full head of hair, and Whitman favoring mutton chops. Spaulding and Blanchett are older in their images, with Spaulding nearly bald, yet with a long beard, and Blanchett also balding. Blanchett is wearing a black priest's gown, with a white collar. His hair is white and thin. Besides captains of foreign vessels, company ships, and the British Royal Navy, like Captain Thomas Bailey of the HMS Modeste, other notable visitors included Scottish botanist David Douglas, who has more than 80 plant species named in his honor, including the Pacific Northwest's perennial favorite, the Douglas fir tree. American John Ball, Fort Vancouver's first official school teacher, dined here, as did adventurers like Nathaniel Wyatt, Jedediah Smith, and the company's own Peter Skeen Ogden of Ogden, Utah fame. And once, and once, there were actually two military spies at this table. Periodically, the table also hosted visiting missionaries, such as Methodist clergyman Jason Lee, Presbyterians Marcus Whitman and Henry Spaulding, and Catholic priest Father Blanchet. Whenever missionaries were present at Fort Vancouver, Dr. McLaughlin invited them to conduct religious services right here in the dining room. In their absence, Dr. McLaughlin and or Mr. Douglas would themselves conduct two church services each Sunday, one Catholic, the other Anglican. In addition to religious services and business discussions, the dining room was also host to festive holiday balls and banquets and a few weddings, including the McLaughlin's daughter Eloisa to company clerk William Glenn Ray. To learn more about the McLaughlin's, let's move to their private quarters. This next section of the video shows coats in a different part of the house, the private quarters. The primary visual change is the wall color, in which the walls are now white instead of the striking green color of the dining room. In this room, a few black and white drawings hang on the walls, and a desk holds a silver tea set and platter. In front of coats, there is a lantern with a lit candle inside, casting a glow onto his face. The portraits of the McLaughlins are shown again, as Coates talks about them. Standing six feet, four inches tall, with broad shoulders and a shock of white hair, Dr. McLaughlin was a towering man in real life and a towering figure in the history of the Pacific Northwest. Doctor, Chief Factor, White-Headed Eagle of Fort Vancouver, King of the Columbia, Father, of Oregon. Dr. McLaughlin had several official and unofficial titles. In this room, however, in his private parlor, in his home, he was called husband and father. It was here that he and his wife, Marguerite, raised their two youngest children, Eloisa and David. And it was here that he dispensed fatherly advice to his oldest son, John Jr., and to his son-in-law, William Glenn Ray as they prepared for a most consequential 1842 assignment to faraway Fort Stikine, Alaska. Dr. McLaughlin purportedly advised them to be kind, be just, be patient, but most of all, remember Napoleon's motto, be master. That aptly summarizes Dr. McLaughlin's own lifelong philosophy, which embraced deliberate and decisive action balanced with compassion. Most importantly, in terms of business, Dr. McLaughlin diversified company operations and increased profits by having the foresight to develop what are still the four pillars of the Pacific Northwest economy. As this next series of images begin, background images change with the words salmon, lumber, wheat, and fruit production. The salmon image shows spawning salmon jumping out of the river at an area of rapids. The lumber image is of cut logs. Wheat is shown through a cluster of wheat stalks, and fruit production returns to a photo of the apples in the fort's orchard. When Coates is talking about the settlers passing through Fort Vancouver, images are shown of a wagon train, surrounded by men on horses, 
A historic illustration of Fort Vancouver focused on a horse-drawn wagon filled with barrels, and images of costumed interpreters enacting various scenes of the period, such as visiting a shop and just lounging around. Illustrations of Fort Vancouver during the time period, shown from afar, show people milling about, to help to set the scene. Also shown are photographs of fur bundles, and a Fort volunteer working in the garden. Salmon lumber, wheat, and fruit production. Then, in 1843, the first wave of hundreds of American settlers coming off the grueling 2,000-mile Oregon Trail reached the gates of Fort Vancouver. Frequently arriving hungry and ill and without provisions, Dr. McLaughlin fed and clothed them, cared for the sick, supplied them with seed for farming, and extended them generous credit. During his tenure as chief factor, Dr. McLaughlin showed deliberate and decisive action by building Fort Vancouver, founding two dozen other fur trading posts, opening new and profitable trapping routes, and promoting agriculture. His compassion, however, was in direct violation of the no assistance policy of the Hudson's Bay Company. Although his humanitarian actions did contribute to his future title, Father of Oregon, those same actions ultimately resulted in his forced resignation from the company. So, in early 1846, 62-year-old Dr. McLaughlin and 71-year-old Marguerite retired to Oregon City. An illustration of Oregon City is shown. The perspective is from a distance and slightly elevated, like the artist was on a nearby hillside with an unobstructed view. The Willamette River cuts the image at a diagonal angle, about a third from the bottom, with that bottom third showing an undeveloped and mostly cleared bank of the river, with a few people milling around on it. The other two-thirds of the image shows the Oregon City waterfront as dozens of wooden buildings, in close proximity to the water and each other. The structures are clustered near the water's edge. Behind the town is a rocky cliff, with a heavy forest behind it. Mount Hood also can be seen in the background. Where new opportunities new challenges, and new titles awaited. That, however, is another chapter for another time. Right now, you're headed to the Douglas side of the house to learn about the important roles of women at Fort Vancouver. Enjoy. Sabrina and Samantha Hansen now take over the narration of the video. They are dressed in long period dresses, sitting behind a table with an olive green tablecloth in the red parlor of the house. Behind them, a cast iron stove extends its exhaust tube upward. It has a couple of lighted lanterns and a teapot sitting on it. There also are a couple of additional lanterns on shelves behind the Hansons. On the table in front of them, there is a spot tea set and some needlework. Hi, I'm Sabrina Hansen. And I'm Samantha Hansen. Welcome to the east quarters of the Chief Factor's house. The West Quarters were home to the McLaughlin family. The East Quarters, the Douglas family. This home was not just a place for business, it was also the home of these two families. It was a house where children were born and grew up. As the Hansons talk, a child's bedroom is shown, with bright blue walls. There is one small bed, on the far wall, that is folded down and ready to be used. There also are two beds, folded up, to allow for more room in the space. Some additional furniture has been placed here, such as chairs and a chest of drawers. In the center of the room, though, is a miniature set of furniture, set up for a small child and dolls, with a tea set on the center table. It looks like the place where kids played. Two photographs of kids in period dress are shown next, illustrating them playing outside with each other with sticks and wooden hoops, tossing the hoops back and forth. Then a couple of scenes illustrate scenes of women in the 19th century eating and socializing. In one of these images, there are six women gathered around a small circular table, working on sewing projects. Other illustrative images, representing diversity at Fort Vancouver, show a man in front of an encampment tent a costumed Native American woman interacting with children in period clothing, and a child looking over harvested vegetables.
and the place where the ladies could gather together and dine in the ladies' mess hall. They mostly spoke French due to their common Canadian origin. John McLaughlin's wife, Marguerite, was a Métis woman, and she came here with him from Canada in the 1820s. Métis men, women, and children had both European and Native ancestry. James Douglas's wife, Amelia, was also Métis. In this house, she had nine children. Only her four youngest daughters survived to adulthood. Women were an important part of this household. Marguerite and Amelia cared for the home while their husbands worked. They taught traditional skills and provided small jobs for the children who lived at the fort. Formal schooling was provided for the children who lived within the palisade. They were taught things such as reading, writing, arithmetic, geography, and religious studies. After showing children writing and studying and working on sewing projects, the background imagery shifts back to the village crossroads of Fort Vancouver, where the fort's operations and the homes of the workers intersected. A photograph of a blacksmith, working on a piece of metal over a flame, shows the viewpoint from outside of the blacksmith's shop, through a closed window. A trapper then is shown, in clothes, in full period regalia, with his floppy hat and some colorful decorative beadwork integrated into the outfit. He also is smoking a pipe. The final image in this series shows a child running through a field rolling a large wooden ring with a stick. The women were particularly skilled. All girls from a young age learned sewing, knitting, beading, embroidery, and how to run a home. In the village to the west of the fort, the workers of Fort Vancouver, blacksmiths, carpenters, coopers, fur trappers, and traders, lived with their wives and children. The last set of background images in this video illustrates everyday life at Fort Vancouver. The first photograph shows costumer interpreters sitting outside of their tent and working on handicrafts. The second image shows Celts drying in the sun, in a grassy field. They are stretched out with the fur side down. The third image shows a couple of different cooking instruments that hang over an open fire. Those are a teapot and a small stove. In contrast with the dinner in the chief factor's house, a photograph shows people eating in one of the village cabins, in a much more modest setting, and the final image of the video, is a young girl, standing over lanterns at night, with the glow of the candles illuminating her face. Women made up almost half the population of Fort Vancouver. Women were either native from many different tribes or Métis. They traveled with fur brigades, helped to prepare furs for trade, gathered food, carried supplies, set up and broke down camp, and cared for their homes and children. Women who lived in the village were obligated to supplement their husbands' rations by foraging or earning money to buy food. Some of those jobs included salmon processing, candle making, making portage straps, and sewing and laundry for the fort gentlemen. Even though they were at an outpost far from civilization, the people of Fort Vancouver enjoyed church services, dances, plays, games, and many of the things we still enjoy today. These are the credits listed at the end of this video and the final piece of audio description provided. National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Presence Park After Dark. An interpretive video series. Producer. Teresa E. Langford Cultural Resources Program Manager. National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Associate Producer. Scott Irvine Park Guide. National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Distribution Coordinator. Megan Huff Carater. National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Research. Eva Aribulo.SPU Coordinator. National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Editor Forward Up the S Videographer. Mark Dodd. Me and the Magman Productions. Interpreters. Reggie Coates. Magdala Mata. Nancy Funk. Sabrina Hansen. Samantha Hansen, Bob Prince, Jeremy Schaefer, Parker Schaefer, Media Contributors, A. Atwood Victor Dallins Doug Fisher, George Gibbs NPS Kerry Hendricks Charles Elestad, John B. Horner Howard Hunt Wayne Hunter, Scott Irvine Paul Kane Ross Kaplan Ray Klein, 
Matthew Klossick Jody Nealon Frank Lawman Jonal Lori NTS Vic Julie Padgett Mary Lou Colvi Dave Powell as the Forest Service Jenny Ray D. Siegens Henry Wren Susan Sheets Walter Seidman Lois Sums Lori Taylor Vidden Taylor Lynn Thompson Sharp Talk Troy Wayron and Ty Watts Robert Wheeler John A. Wythe M.D. Sarah Scenes Fernando Bravo Litho Fort Gus Davis So National Park Service Painting Village Diana Bonin National Park Service Richard Schlecht Fova Painting Day and Ha Publishers Engravers Dutton Thomas Goldsworth Engraver Inglefield Lieutenant Artist Messrs Force Publishers Hello, EJ Artist Stracker Engraver British Columbia Archives Courtesy of the Mariners Museum and Park National Archives and Records Administration National Park Service Photo Sick 25471 E.W. Merrill Sitka National Historical Park Music Contributors Heart Strings featuring Nancy and Rob Downey Emily Coder Special Thanks to Tracy Fortman Superintendent National Park Service at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site Copyright 2020